place. Here's a chance to leave if you're in the wrong place. Make sure I'm in the right place. Always a toss up. All right, so let's get started. Uh, so I'm Professor Langdon White. You can call me Professor Langdon. You can call me Professor White. Um, I spent actually about 15 years or so as a software consultant, uh, doing mostly boutique software consulting. Does anybody know what boutique software consulting is? Okay, so it's basically the distinction is like fast, high risk, um, you know, kind of high end projects. Uh, it's funny, it's like when I try to describe it to people, it's like I made websites technically, but they usually were a lot more complicated than that. Um, and then uh, I got tired of doing that. So I joined a product company called Red Hat. Is anybody familiar with Red Hat? Now IBM. Uh, can you tell me what it is? Yes, that is a very unusual answer. So most people think of Red Hat as uh, like the biggest product, which is called Linux. Um, and basically, even though it's an open source project, you can, uh, they basically sell service and support on it. Uh, but they have a number of other products that uh, people don't know often as well, Ansible being one of them, uh, which is one I use all the time. Um, but they're a unique software company in that every piece of software that they have is all open source, unless they acquired a company and they have to clean up the code before they can open source it. Uh, so kind of unique. Um, in my While I was at Red Hat, uh, my relationship with DU began where I started uh, working with the Spark program which if you're unfamiliar, as I think many of you are new to BU, uh, the Spark program uh, is focused on experiential learning experience or experiential learning experiences, I don't know, too many experiences um, for kind of anybody in tech in a sense. So it might be data science, might be software engineering, machine learning, uh, maybe stats, certain kinds of math uh, so that you can actually work on real world projects uh, with uh, real world partners uh, in kind of a structured class sort of way. So that it's not always, uh, you know, just little projects manufactured by professors and actually work on something messy. So I teach a couple of classes for that uh, software engineering practicum and a machine learning practicum. Uh, I was just coming from the machine learning one. That's why I was a little late. I will try to be here on time in the future. Um, and so this is me. Uh, these are my three kids. Uh, they're my three kids. So they don't really like each other. So putting them all in one picture is very challenging. Um, and uh, but that's me. Uh, so but I wanna talk about also some of the other people. So Graham, he is our teaching fellow. Uh, he is currently stuck in Canada because he tested positive for COVID, then tested positive for COVID again when he was trying to get on a plane uh, and couldn't get on the plane. Then he tried to get on another plane and then there was a snowstorm, so he couldn't get on that plane either. He is theoretically going to be here today. Uh, we're all crossing our fingers that he makes it back from the dark north. Um, but uh, so, he has regular office hours. Uh, here's a little bit about him. Um, and we'll talk more about how you can contact everybody in a few minutes. All right. But I like everybody to see people's faces, particularly in our mass world where, you know, like I had a Zoom call with students the other day and most of them I had never seen their whole face before. Uh, it was kind of entertaining. Uh, so we have a couple of course assistants they're called uh, for this course. One is Ben Gardner and I didn't see him yet. See here. Okay, so he may not be here yet. Um, and so his background, data science and economics, um, and uh, he took this course before. And so basically that's the criterion to be a course assistant. So if you like this course, uh, please you know, join us as we go forward and help us be course assistants uh, in future class. Um, so basically the idea with course assistant is it's kind of another person you can turn to who you might, you know, if you're having any trouble, uh, you can talk to about the course and homework and projects and that kind of stuff, because they have some experience with it. Uh, and they know when the problem is because we had a typo in the, in the homework versus a problem that is uh, something that maybe they can bring me or Graham into to help you solve. All right, and then we have Bella. Uh, and so Bella, uh, do you wanna introduce yourself? Cause you're, you're here. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Bella, I'm a film student, but data science and finance, and I'm pursuing journalism. Um, I mentioned all of that because data science really works in so many different realms, not just the only data science. So don't be afraid to kind of make this class work for you if you're looking for a different field or interest. So if you
exactly. Um, and we will talk about that more as well. Um, so these slides will be distributed. So, you know, don't worry about like taking pictures of them or something. Um, but so, and all this information is also repeated in the syllabus. Um, and hopefully it's all the same information as I think it is. Um, so for the next couple weeks, uh, given Omicron and all that jazz, we're kind of expecting or, or suggesting that people look for virtual office hours. Um, you know, so I will be sitting in my office during those periods of time, but you, I am perfectly happy to talk to you over Zoom uh, during that period of time if you don't feel comfortable coming to the office. Um, and for the teaching fellow, you know, obviously he's not even back yet. Um, and then the course assistants, you know, for the near the near term, um, please reach out to them over email and just set up a time and we can do some Zoom calls. Um, they will be available during these times, um, but for the next, like I said, couple of weeks, we're kind of encouraging virtual. If you really want to do an in-person meeting, uh, just let us know and we'll figure out a way to do it. All right. I'm a lot less concerned about it because I had it over Christmas. So, all right. So, what is data science? Okay. Well, oh, actually, before we get to it, let's let's talk about. Yeah. Never mind. Okay. So yeah. So what is data science? Uh, I got my slides out of order. Um, okay. So where I like to start with this is that. Data science is kind of a new label for an old thing, okay? Um, and if, you know, if this is any example, you'll see in a minute, um, why do we need a new label for an old thing? Because it's gotten pretty fundamentally changed. Okay, so everyone here, I assume is familiar with statistics, at least the concept of, if not, you know, the execution of. Um, and maybe, and I, I'm still planning to look this up and find out if it's true, uh, but there may be an apocryphal quote by Mark Twain that's lies, damn lies, and statistics, right? So statistics are challenging, okay, in a couple of different ways. One, the math can be really hard. Two, it's, it can be very easy to present things incorrectly, okay? Um, and in fact, because of this problem, so basically uh, the scale of things that we're talking about have grown so exponentially that the math is like nearly impossible for humans. Okay, so now we basically have to use computers whenever we want to do material data science work. Okay, for anything, and it doesn't matter the field, right? To Bella's point, okay, that when you're talking about huge amounts of data, you just you can't do it on the back of an napkin anymore, right? You have to use a computer to kind of work with it. And so what I like to start off with is. Um, <laughs> In a computer, this is the size of things. So everyone here has probably heard of like a megabyte or a gigabyte. Okay, so that is because computers, as you probably know, right, only work with zeros and ones, on off switches, okay? And you can store, and that's referred to as one bit, okay? So an on off can be true or false, right? That's a good way to do it, or a zero or a one if you wanna do it in terms of numbers. So then you get up to a byte. So then we talk about a character, okay? So that is eight bits and a character. Can we know what a character is? Yeah. Right, so, there, so it's basically a letter, except we say character because it includes not only all the letters, but also all the punctuation and all the numbers. So we refer to them as characters instead of referring to them as letters, say, because it's, it's a broader term. All right, so then we get up to a kilobyte, which is a thousand bytes, okay, or about a whatever it says, 200 word essay, okay. Now, mind you, that's English, okay. Different languages have different uh, numbers of words, you know, and so different, or, sorry, different numbers of letters in the words and common. So all these stats are based on English. Um, and then a megabyte is about a one minute of music. And then a gigabyte, again, a thousand more than the prior, is 230 songs. And then a terabyte, let me know the TV show, the cartoon TV show Avatar. The entire series, okay, is about one terabyte, okay? And then the US Library of Congress, which is where theoretically a copy of everything published in the US has a copy, is about 74 terabytes as of like the last year or two. Petabyte, three and a half years of video. Now these are getting pretty big, right? That's a lot of data. 
um, the human brain is only two and a half petabytes. Obviously, you know, not exactly because it's humanity versus computers. Um, but then we talk about exabytes. All the words ever spoken by mankind is five exabytes, ever, like in all time. Okay. And then a zettabyte, which you're starting to see, if one gigabyte was one brick, that's 258 brick balls a second. Right? So massive. Why do I bring this up? Because this is the growth of data. Right? So, and it's in zettabytes. So in 2012, right, that's what about 1.9 zettabytes. And look at that curve. That's a lot of data, right? A lot of stuff. You know, the democratization of computers has been, you know, very uplifting for a lot of people, but also has caused a lot of problems, right? Um, and this is one of them. Massive amounts of data, as well as the kind of mechanisms to keep that data have also grown exponentially. So this is why Facebook knows everything you've ever done, okay? And the reason that they do that is because from a, from a business perspective, it's really important for them to know that they have all this information. They don't know how they're going to use it yet, but they just collect it in case they might want to use it someday. So they collect everything they can with the goal of being able to turn it into something useful eventually, right? So it leaves us also a problem to the problems that we'll talk about later, but not at this minute. But the point being is that that's part of why the growth is happening is because there's all these organizations that have a vested interest in spending the money in storing as much information as they can find. Okay. So, you know, think we need a little science for that? Um, you know, when you're talking about things at this kind of scale, you, you just cannot wrap your head around it, right? It's just too big. So what we do in the data science world is we try to give you techniques to kind of wrap your head around it, okay? So that's the goal. Um, and to Bella's earlier point, if you want to do, you know, investigative journalism, if you want to do, you know, if you want to work in insurance, if you want to work in or you want to do something with, um, you know, social good, for example, having the ability to take in a whole mess of data and turn that into something actionable is a very useful skill. Um, and doesn't mean you have to come in being a programmer. It doesn't mean you have to come in being a statistician. It just means that you have to learn enough of the tools. So, uh, you know, another great example, um, the city of Boston a few years ago, um, trying to figure out what to do about the problem of, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, of Uber and Lyft stopping all over the place, right? And one of the things that they wanted to use to inform that decision was um, where do they do the most drop-offs? Now, if you think about it, Uber and Lyft do not want to share that information with anyone, right? Much less each other, direct competitors, right? They do not want to share that. So um, one of the techniques that is like a specialty at BU is this technique called MPC, which is multi-party computation. And it's a way of, with them both keeping their secrets, actually calculating something, an outcome, such that you can figure out where all the drop-off locations are for both of them without either one revealing the data to anybody else. That's kind of pretty advanced data science, but that's the kind of stuff you can do. And if you haven't been there, um, the bar up the street from my house called Lincoln uh, is the number one drop-off place in the city of Boston for Uber and Lyft. Um, not sure how I feel about that, but it is a good place. So, um, all right. So what are we doing here? Okay, so DS100, the goal of this class is it's an introduction to the field. My expectation is that you do not have a lot of background in this, okay? I don't also have an expectation that you plan to be a computer scientist or a data scientist or a statistician. You can if you decide to be, but that's not the expectation, okay? Um, I don't know if it's throwing me off more to see my slides out there or not. It, it seems helpful, but uh, like I'm so not used to it, it keeps catching my eye. Um, the other thing is speaking to that, uh, you know, the earlier quote about from Mark Twain, 
is, and this was coined by my youngest son, uh, being able to identify bull shrimp. Okay. Um, my, my children have this odd feeling that they should never swear around us. Um, I'm not entirely sure why, because we're not that strict about it, but they do not. So bull shrimp uh, came into common usage a while ago, uh, and I really, really like it. Um, so there's two things here, right? One is how do you identify when somebody is selling you something that isn't true, okay? It looks true because the numbers look true, but they aren't actually. So how do you figure that out? Okay, that's one of the things we hope to teach you. The other thing we hope to teach you is how to not do it by accident yourself, right? It's very easy to present data and, and cause another person to come to the wrong conclusion, okay? This is one of the problems with English and basically all human spoken languages, right? Is that what I say and what you hear are not always the same thing. Okay? The same is true with something like stats. It might even be worse, right? Where I'm gonna present some information and your takeaway is actually not what I thought I presented, even if it's just on accident, right? So we're gonna to try to help you be able to explain that better such that people can understand what you're doing and the importance of things like uh, showing your work, essentially. Um, so you may remember from you know lower grades, right? You always had to show your work in math class. When we're talking about data science, it's important for as much as possible for you to be able to show your work so that a, another statistician or another data scientist or whatever can look at what you did and see how you got to that conclusion. Um, and sometimes it'll even involve like non-disclosure agreements or whatever. So the Uber and Lyft example. So you could actually have a third party look at the data who's required by law to not reveal anything about the data and ensure that the methods and techniques, et cetera, were used correctly. Um, and then finally, you know, have some fun with data, right? So uh, we have a whole mess of like homework and projects and things like that um, that come from wildly different fields um, that should give you a little bit of exposure to you know things about like globalization and racism and things like that based on actual data. Um, the one I particularly re regularly remember is like the jury selection pool for a case in let's say the 1800s um, and, and its racial makeup. Uh, and the, the results of the science uh, are kind of mind blowing, but that's a future lecture. So we don't wanna give away too much at the moment. <clears throat> All right, any questions so far? Yeah. I think that's the next slide. Wait for, way to go on the segue. Look at that. <laughs> You'll get your five bucks later. Um, all right, so which of you already know? Okay, coding, high level math, stats, bull shrimp. Uh, let's see. That is a brilliant slide, right? You got, you got to give me that. You know, awesome slide. It really needs caps, but other than that. Um, so no, my expectation is you do not know anything about coding. You do not know anything about programming. Um, I will try as much as possible to use, uh, you know, any slang or jargon that we use in this course. I will try as often as I can to make sure I explain what it is. Um, it can be difficult for me, right? Because I've been using it for so long that it's just part of my language. But I do try very hard. The thing I always go back to is uh, there's a kind of half joke, half serious of a student who's in a computer science class, you know, an introduction to computer science. And they walk out of the class and they were like, I don't know why there was so much talk of sewing in the class. Like, what, what was that about? Why is that? It's because in programming, we refer to a set of characters often as a string, right? Because it's a set of them, right? But a string is a real thing. It's a string, right? So if you haven't had any exposure to programming or coding or whatever, like string. So like I said, I try as much as possible to make sure I kind of back up and, and explain the terminology. If you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand um, because, right, somebody else might be thinking the same thing. Or you can post things anonymously to Piazza if you're not sure you want to share with everyone that you have this question. Um, but if you have it, it's likely other people do as well. High level math. So yes, there's some arithmetic. Okay, it's funny, I used to have a professor in college who made the distinction between arithmetic and math. 
Okay. I can't do arithmetic to save my life. You, you will see me during the course of this semester struggling with arithmetic. Four plus five, and I'm stuck. Okay. But I can do math. Okay. And she, her distinction was always that math is things like graph theory and number theory and, you know, and things like data science. Um, and so that stuff I can do, but I struggle with arithmetic. So uh, you should be fine if you've done a bit of arithmetic. Um, you know, we will talk about some little bits of higher level math in the sense of things like um, quadratic equations, like what they are, but we're not really going to expect you to develop your own equations. It's more like to solve this problem, we use this thing, uh, if that makes sense. Um, and then stats, same vein, you know, stats really is just higher level math, um, but a lot of people put it kind of in a different class, but it really is just kind of a type of math. Again, we won't really, we certainly won't require you to know a lot about kind of high level statistics. We'll talk about them a little bit because that's kind of the nature of data science, um, but we'll explain everything. Like we don't expect you to come in with anything. Um, I do hope that you, at least in general, can recognize both terms, right? And what I'm hoping to do is I'm gonna make your skill for that better, right? All right, any questions? All right, so expectations. Let me just see what my next slide is. Um, that is way too small to read. Give me one second. Yeah, okay, so uh, attendance is expected in the lectures um, because primarily people have questions in the class. They bring it up in the class, we answer them in the class, right? Um, and as a result, uh, they won't really be captured in the lecture slides. So we do post the lecture slides at the end of every class. Um, there's, uh, you know, and, and they're perfectly accessible and all that stuff. It's just, it may not have the same context, right? Um, and then the other part uh, is that we will record uh, lectures as often as possible. I sometimes have technical failures and forget to unmute it or something. So occasionally I screw it up. We'll release those, assuming they're in good quality, uh, about two weeks after the lecture, give or take. Um, and so they will be available to you, but they'll be a little deep. Okay. So do try to come to class um, as it specifies, I think, in the syllabus. You can miss three. If you have a good reason, don't come to class. You know, if you're not feeling well, don't come to class. It is totally fine to not come to class. But do you know? But the goal is that most of you should be here most of the time. Um, and please let myself and Graham know if you don't think you'll be able to come to class. And if you know, and under certain conditions, we'll see if we can do anything about helping you uh, anyway, right? Um, and then, oh, of course, the other part is it's a lot more interesting for me if all of you are here uh, giving me feedback on. You know, I can I can hopefully try to tell when I'm getting blank stares of you're explaining this very badly. Please try to do it better. Um, that way, I get some feedback on how we're we're teaching this stuff as well. Um, and that's what I have to say about that. Yeah. All right, we have another component to this class, um, which is called the discussion section. Um, which, if you're new to BU, it won't matter that much. But if you've been in other BU classes. A discussion section is normally led by the teaching fellow or the teaching assistant um, and is a, a discussion. So in other words, there may be a question that's brought up and you discuss it or you bring up questions that you have about what happened in class or in the lecture and you want more detail, you want to talk about the homework, you want to talk about labs, etc. cetera. Uh, for this class, uh, we actually try to split that discussion into two parts. One, the actual discussion component and then the other part is we have what we refer to as a lab. So this is similar to like a homework or a project um, where uh, you basically can work uh, on, you know, a, a problem to solve, right? We do encourage for the lab to do it collaboratively, okay? So you'll be assigned to a team. Um, and so you should work together as a team to, to try to resolve the lab. The labs, I believe, are due the Sunday after they're assigned, so they're discussion sections are on Friday, but you actually have till the end of the day on Sunday to finish the lab because you may not have enough time during this discussion section itself. Um, and the expectation is that, um, you know, when you're working on that lab, 
even outside of the discussion section, you can meet up with your team. Um, and you know what I would encourage, right, is group study sessions are a great idea always. Um, and the and so if you meet up again to kind of finish the lab, that's a good thing. Uh, and one of the things I like to point out about group uh, discussion sections or you know you know doing teams is that you know there's a lot of people in this industry, both data science, computer science, to some extent even math, uh, who look like me, right? Who come from a very similar socioeconomic background as I do. You know what? What is the single biggest failure with facial recognition software? Does anybody know? It's really good at recognizing white men. It's really bad at recognizing nearly everything else. Why do you think that might be? Everyone designing them was, was white men and or right um, everyone who was involved in producing the, the data to train it they were taking pictures of themselves right uh, and so and it may not be explicit right it totally be implicit it may not even have occurred to the people that you know having a variation in the inputs would make that much of a difference to the facial recognition software so it's not necessarily malicious but that's what's so pervasive and negative about it that if you don't work with people who are different from yourself, you will not see errors that are caused by what you know who you are, right? And I'm not just talking about race, right? I'm talking about socioeconomic. I'm talking about where you grew up. You know, one of my classic examples from my uh, software consulting time is working with Indians uh, in particular. Is that in the American you know English culture? If I say, "Hey, can you get this done by Wednesday?" And the person responds to me, they say yes, that means yes, I will do it. Okay. A lot of the time in the Indian culture, if they say yes, it means I understand. Doesn't mean that they will do it. Right. My phrasing might have been a little weird on that, but the point being is that yes, in like Indian culture, tends to mean like I agree, not that I'm sorry, that I understand, not that I agree. Okay, so it's stupid stuff like that, where both people are using the same term and have the best intentions, but they're not communicating, right? So when you work with a team of any kind, it's really, really important to try to mix up, you know, what that team looks like and making sure that you listen to everyone on the team, because almost guaranteed, you're going to have gaps in how you, you know, basically your background that change the meaning of things, right? All right, oh, and the last thing is um, the discussion section is considered mandatory. So kind of in the same way as the lectures are, all right? If you can't make it for some reason, please let us know, but you are expected to attend um, because particularly for the discussion section, it's even worse on the not very useful to everyone if not everyone is there, right? <coughs> All right, and then homework. Um, so it's released during Tuesday's class. Um, not oh, today's Thursday, so I guess we, we win. But uh, so the first one should be released next Tuesday, but we may not because we like to have a discussion section before we do the first homework. We're still playing it by ear. The, the semester starting on lecture day is, is challenging for us. There is no discussion tomorrow. Okay. Uh, so even though it's probably on your calendar for tomorrow, you are not expected to be there. And hopefully Graham will actually be in the country, um, but he will definitely not be there. So there is no discussion section tomorrow. Um, but generally speaking, it will be released during the Tuesday class and it's due by um, Thursday for extra credit or by the following Tuesday, okay? Make sense, questions? All right, so the homeworks are not expected to be done collaboratively. Um, okay, and then from a textbook perspective, there is a book. So this course is, is based on a course at Berkeley uh, called Data 8. The uh, originators of that course wrote a book called Computational Inferential Thinking. It is available for free online. Uh, this is a link to it. Uh, we will reference it regularly, okay? However, if you notice in the syllabus, 
which maybe we'll just pull it up. Um, ah. So everything that I'm saying is also in this document, or it should be, yeah. Oh, is it? Ah, I always forget to unlock it. Is it really ready yet? I'm always asking myself. Uh, let me fix that real quick. All right, it should be open now. Okay, so talking about the syllabus. Uh, so everything I've talked about so far is, you know, also in the syllabus. Um, from a broader perspective, uh, so how many of you are aware of, of what BU calls like hub units or the BU hub? Okay, so in, in my experience with going to college, we called it the equivalent of like core. What's kind of neat about hub, right, is that you can take a whole mess of different classes and satisfy the, the requirement. Whereas like I had to take English 101 or place out of it basically. Um, so I think it's kind of neat, but the explanation of what hub credits we're hoping you will not, I mean, you will receive the hub credits, but we're hoping that you're going to take away from this course, uh, as far as the hub is concerned, is what's outlined in this section of the syllabus. Um, I do recommend giving it a read, um, you know, but uh, it may not, it may be stuff you've read already. Um, so what was I looking for? Okay, so here's the books and other course material. Oh, but what I really wanted to show you was apparently comments that are unresolved. Um, was this uh, schedule, okay? And so in the schedule is when all this stuff is due, okay? So that you can kind of plan around your other classes, right? Um, and, but I will say, this is always a little tentative, okay? Based on kind of how the class is doing on, you know, subject A, we may want to touch on subject A a little bit more. So we might shift things around a little bit. So do check for updates, okay? It is in Piazza. Whenever we update it, we will update it to Piazza. And I will generally speaking announce it in class as well. Um, so two questions. Uh -huh. so what does the homework generally look like? It's going to be like- I'll get to that in, yeah, I'll show you in a minute. Oh, what was the other question? Oh, okay. I think, yeah, I got Oh, uh, the not You might not be uh, registered for it technically after class. I mean, I have access to the class. Can anybody get into Blackboard? Get in there. I can get into the classroom. The syllabus isn't there. Oh, yeah. So the syllabus is not in Blackboard. Um, I always put it in Piazza. Sorry, oh, stylistic. Okay. Uh, it's under the resources tab in Piazza. Um, but that's a good point. We should probably take it there too. The pro it's one of these things where, uh, so there's a programming term called uh, DRY. Uh, so all caps, it's an acronym. Do not repeat yourself. So it, it galls me to have multiple copies of anything anywhere, because then anytime it changes, I have to remember all the places I have to update, right? Um, and so I that's why I tend not to have multiple copies, but I can also see why it's difficult when you're trying to find it, right? And not looking in the right place. Um, in my in my grand future plans, there will be a website, and then it can just have all this stuff. Um, okay, so what I wanted to point out here, though, is that on the readings, okay, um, these are the chapters in that book. I recommend, but do not require, that you read the chapters before the lecture, okay, because it will often help to understand it. By trying to, by basically seeing it twice and kind of from two different perspectives, right? The authors of the book are not me, so they're going to explain things differently than I explain things. So hopefully, between the two of us, you'll understand it better. Okay. Um, homeworks are there, projects are there, labs are there. Um, but like I said, sometimes it changes, usually not too drastically. Um, and so this is something that you should kind of try to keep track of. Uh, this is also something that bothers me that's not very dry. It should be an actual calendar that you could like add to Google Calendar, but that's for a, that's for a future Google. Um, let's see, going back to slides. All right, 
So one of the other things I like to point out is that the syllabus, right, is a contract, okay? And by contract, what that means is this is the agreement we're making. Um, unlike a real contract, we will make some changes without your approval, um, but it is the, the contract that we have for this class. This is how the grading is going to work. This is how much the homework is worth. This is how much projects are worth. This is what we expect you to complete. Um, and you should, for this class and every other class, you should treat it as such, right? That this is the you know goal of the course, um, and that you know you should so you should be aware of it, like you would be aware of, of like a, a contract to buy a car or something. Okay, so it's important to read it and make sure you understand it. If you have questions, let us know, and we can either rewrite it because it's not very clear, or we can explain what we meant to say, you know, etc. Um, so these are the things that you should definitely read. Like I said, the hub credit stuff you may have seen elsewhere. It's boilerplate. Uh, so worth reading if you haven't read it before, um, but you shouldn't see any differences between our learning outcomes and some other class that has the same learning outcome for that hub credit. Uh, the course description is basically what are our goals? Like, why are you here? Right. Um, books and other course materials. We talked about that a little bit. Courseware. Piazza, Grade Scope, Blackboard, uh, and we're going to be introducing Top Hat as well, which I think landed in the welcome email. So hopefully you signed up for that. We did have a question about what version to get. Um, we think we will be fine with Basic. Um, plus, I, it bothers me to ask you to spend money. Um, so we think that's going to be sufficient. Uh, but we're we're experimenting a little bit with Top Hat, so we may have to revise that opinion in you know a month. Um, but long story short, get basic for now. Hopefully that'll be sufficient for what we want to do with the class. Um, and then of course, assignments and grading. This is where the grading breakdown is. Um, and then how to succeed in this course uh, is also, I think, useful. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and do please know, right? I do use jargon in the syllabus that you may not recognize. That's totally fine. You can either follow up with us or I will explain it at some point during the course as well. Let's see, what time does the call start? 3.30? Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's just talk about the grading a little bit. All right, can everybody read that? I don't know how big it is. Is that better? Um, yeah, it's scrolling problem. All right, so class and online participation. Online participation is stuff like Top Hat, um, Piazza, etc. Um, class participation, I think you're all familiar with, which is raise your hand and say something. Um, I will also ask entertaining questions like uh, here's an either or, raise your left or right hand to say which one you think it is. Um, Bella particularly likes that. Um, but then we hope to incorporate uh, Top Hat to do some of that as well. Um, and that's the, so that's that portion. Um, lab activities and drills, it's really just lab activities. Uh, remove and drills. I don't know, maybe we're gonna do squats or something later. I, I don't know, push-ups, lots of push-ups. Um, and then homework assignments, um, I, believe, I believe that's accurate. I think there's 10 of them, 20% of your grade. Uh, the programming data analysis project, 15%. Um, and then the midterm and final exams. Um, so, one of the things we're hoping we can do for the final exam is actually make a portion of it like a project rather than like an exam, but I'm not sure we'll be able to get it ready in time. So, um, so right now is a proper final exam. It has a day during finals week that they haven't told us yet, so I can't tell you, um, but uh, it will it will probably, you know, if we can't do the project thing, we'll structure it like we did last time which will be there will be a written portion, okay, which will be things like terminology, that kind of stuff. Um, and there will be a coding portion, which will be done online, okay? Um, and the midterm will probably be structured the same way. Uh, what I can tell you is that the midterm exam is at present, I think scheduled for, right before spring break, right? That was my, my hope. Yeah. So basically, it's the last day before spring break. Okay, so you don't have to worry about it over spring break. Um, and 
Yeah, and so that's midterm. The midterm is here, so you just come to the lecture like normal. Okay. Uh, I don't, you know, we're we're kind of full in this classroom, so it's going to be a little complicated. But did you have a question? Is your arm just all right? Um, all right. Any questions about the grading? Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So one of the things I want to point out, okay, I at least when I talk about it, I feel like there's a lot of like homework and labs and projects in this class. And I completely agree, they're off. But the reason is, is because learning to program, unlike many other activities, it is ridiculously hard to do without doing it yourself, okay? So much like writing, um, you don't become a better writer without actually writing, okay? The same goes with programming. It just, the, the feeling you get, like it becomes second nature, things like that, all of that stuff just comes from doing it because you just kind of have to manually kind of type it in. You have to manually like make the mistakes. So we do a couple of things for that, right? We, we have these homeworks, we have the projects, we have the labs. What we also do is during the course of the semester, um, during lectures, you can actually live follow along on the coding. Um, sometimes it would require really fast typing, but I do try to give you a template beforehand. So it gives you the bulk of it. And then you can kind of follow along during the class. Because even if you're watching me do it and typing it yourself, it's still better than just hearing. It's still like, it really does work. And take this from somebody who, you know, I've been programming for a long time. It is totally the case. As soon as I stop doing it, even if I'm like paying attention to it all the time, I get rusty fast. Like it's really crazy. Um, another thing that's a very modern uh, technique, uh, who here uses Twitch? All right, has anybody ever watched any software development stuff on Twitch? All right, so Twitch for software development can be really amazing. And the reason is, is because, so what you're watching on Twitch for software development, similar to Minecraft, right, is somebody actually doing the thing, okay? And because they're actually doing the thing and you're watching them do it in real time, one of the things that you learn from that or can learn from that is what's referred to as debugging, or what do you do when there's a problem, okay? Best way to do that is experience. That's, that's how you get to be good at it. You know what's close to actually having experience? Watching somebody who has experience make mistakes and then fix that. So it's, I don't know, it's really interesting. I used to host a show um, that was basically all about containerization, um, and we would regularly, like our goal in a sense was to fail on the regular, right? Like, we want to have at least one massive blow up per show. Um, and then we fix it, right? There's another show actually that is all about it. Like every show, they plan it. They actually, they take one person who sets up the problem and then the other person is just presented with, here, go do this. And the whole show is about them failing and fixing it. So I strongly recommend it. Um, you know, I'll try to publish a list of ones that I like, um, but, I am not a consumer of Twitch very well. Like it, video doesn't work well for me. Um, so I'm not great at coming up with the list, but I'm, I've been trying to collect a good one. Uh, but I strongly recommend it, especially if you're like, you know, visually oriented uh, to, as, a, as a good way to learn. Um, so finding ones about Python, which is gonna be the primary programming language we use for this, uh, would definitely help if you're a visual learner like that. Any questions? The other one I think is super interesting is uh, TikTok is starting to see more software world stuff. Um, and I think that's super interesting because, you know, what, what's the maximum of three minutes um, is, uh, you know, it's just really neat trying to see what the people cram into that three minutes. <clears throat> I'm kind of a tech junkie, if you couldn't guess. All right, one of the things that uh, I mentioned earlier, open source, um, do not use other people's stuff without giving credit or being sure that you're allowed to use it, okay? Does anybody here, can anybody here tell me if I publish something on the internet and I do not put any sort of notice about the copyright on it, who owns it? Can you reuse it? I think you still own it, but the site may have some rights. So yeah, so, Pretending the terms of service don't exist, 
by default, I own anything I publish, period, end of story. So if it doesn't say anything, you cannot use it unless you can sneak it under fair use law, which I usually can because I'm an educator. But generally speaking, there needs to be a license on it. So one of the things you should also remember is that if you are using somebody else's stuff, make sure that you attribute it. Make sure that you know that you can use it because this is something that we will probably discover um, and we will ask you about. It. And we don't like having that uncomfortable conversation. So please, you know, be aware of what you're consuming. The entire universe of kind of data science that we're going to be working with is all open source with wide open uh, kind of usage models. So the likelihood you run into these things is pretty low. That's what's so cool about this particular world. And maybe we'll talk about licensing some more in another lecture, but not today. All right, now for a demo. And hopefully the demo gods will favor us. But I think I'm missing the tab. One second while it decides to load. All right. Uh, this is a piece of software called Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter spelled instead of an I with a Y. Okay. Jupyter Notebook is a platform for doing data science and machine learning with Python in a way that is kind of easy to consume or easy to use. Okay. Um, there is an organization at BU called uh, Research Computing Center. They host uh, basically several different kind of data centers. One of them is called the um, Shared Computing Center, uh, so or SCC. And we're going to be using the SCC for, to your earlier question, all the homework, all the projects, all the labs. Okay. So all of you already have accounts or should have accounts, um, and we will show you how to kind of log into them how to make Jupyter start, et cetera. Has anybody here ever used Jupyter Notebook before? Okay. So if you've used Jupyter Notebook before, notebook before, you can certainly use it in any way you like. However, the reason we offer this site or whatever is because I don't want to debug every person's laptop, okay? So, um, you know, if you run into problems, feel free to ask and I might just be like, oh yeah, this is what's wrong. Um, but if I can't, I'm not going to spend a lot of energy trying to figure it out. I'm going to say, please use the SEC. Um, so feel free to use it. It's just that I just don't want to support it. Okay. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is this part up here. And the reason I want to talk about it is because you can largely ignore it. What that's doing there, and I was thinking about this analogy today. Um, imagine you're a construction company, right? As a construction company, you own a whole mess of tools, right? From hammers to you know jigsaws to whatever. When one of your employees, let's say a carpenter, goes to a job site or whatever, they are only going to take the tools that they need, right? They're not going to take every tool that exists. So they're going to just take the ones that they or they expect to need. Let's put that way. That's what we're doing here. Okay. What we're doing is we're declaring these are the tools we're going to use in this piece of code, okay? And the reason you have to declare it is so that I don't get everything in the universe. I only get the tools I need for this particular problem. <coughs> Excuse me. All the talking tends to make me cough. I apologize in advance. Um, so while you can largely ignore this, uh, the reason I bring it up is just, all it is is a toolbox. All you're doing is declaring what tools you want out of the toolbox. Um, and then go on your happy merry way. Um, this is always awkward because it's over there and not over here, um, but we'll show you. So what a Jupyter Notebook wants to do is just write code, um, just kind of write on there and just execute. So for example, 
if it's something really simple, like you want to add two numbers together, you can just type in two plus three, and then you can hit shift enter, um, or actually let me point out with the arrow, um, or you can hit this little run button up here, okay, which will run what's referred to as the current cell. Okay, so each of these things is a cell. Um, and I'm just kind of giving a brief introduction to this here. What we're going to do is either in a lecture next week or in the discussion section next week, that's what we haven't figured out yet, uh, we'll actually work with each of you to make sure you can kind of log in, set it up, and then kind of go through an exercise to make sure everything's working for you. Um, but so, yeah, so you can type arbitrary, you know, uh, you know mathematical expressions, um, you know, etc in here and kind of continue on your merry way. So to run it, like I said, most commonly, most people use shift and enter because it's easy. Um, but if you like to use the mouse, you can always use the arrow up there. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is that you can also add cells. Actually, let me do it here. OK, and now I can type whatever I want, right? So I can say 387 divided by, I'll say, let's stick with simple stuff plus 38, and then I get a result, right? So you just add ones arbitrarily, keep on your merry way. The only thing you have to remember is that that first one, because you need to go get your tools, you need to run that one before you run anything else. Okay? So as a little demo for a little exercise, um, what we're going to do is I just ran this uh, this cell, um, and at this URL, okay, you're all familiar with URLs, right? Okay. Um, does anybody know what URL stands for? Yes. Um, which is different. It's actually a special case of URI, which is Universal Resource uh, Indicator, um, and. Uh, and so you can actually have other things than URLs, uh, which most people are casual users of the internet don't realize. But that's what this HTTP designates. Um, and so at the same place as the book, there's a copy of the entire text of Huck Finn. And the reason we have the entire text of Huck Finn is because it's not a copyright at this point, so it's free to use for whatever you want. Um, and so what it's going to do is just going to go and collect all of the text at that URL using this command. Then it's going to break the book off into chapters. Okay. Um, and we won't get into too much detail about how it's doing that. Um, but now there's now we have a set of chapters. And we'll talk about Little Women in more in a minute, but Little Women is doing the same thing. Okay. You're all familiar with those two books? Whether you've read them or not, you know they exist. Um, all right. So. There's my mouse. There we go. Okay. So, what I want to show you is that, as you can see, all of the text, and this is another of those kind of magic words or whatever, text is another term for characters or a set of characters. Okay. And the reason we specify text is because something that is text is actually text, it's actually a set of characters versus an image of text. If you follow me. So, like a picture, you know, when you take a picture of whatever problem you're having today and you send it to your parents to ask you them to fix it, that's a picture. It's not actual words, right? They, they can't be man manipulated by the computer particularly easily. Whereas this is actually text, it's actually the set of characters, so it's easier to manipulate. So, between these brackets, uh, is if I scroll a little bit, you'll see that. Each chapter is like broken up in there, but it'll be kind of buried. And as you can see, right, it's quite a long book, so there's a lot of text there. So we're going to ignore it. Um, but then what we can do is we can dump it into this object called a table. Okay, and a table in this sense is exactly what you think of as like a table, like when you did, you know, when you want to do a pro cons list of what university to choose, or you want to do uh, maybe you did truth tables in high school or something. Um, but it's just a table. So that means that there are rows in the table and it has columns in the table. This particular table has one column called chapter. 
and then x, whatever it is, 33 plus probably 10 uh, rows uh, in the table. And each row holds one chapter of text. Okay, so we'll be using this table construct all the time in this class. That's why I kind of pointed out a little bit more. All right. Gotta move a little faster. Okay, so coming back to that character term, and one of the things that I regularly say, right? Software engineers are ridiculously lazy. Okay. Like if there is a way to make something simpler or easier or shorter, they will take it. It does not matter if it makes any sense as a result. Okay. So it can be that's part of why we have so much jargon and so much slang, because we're wicked lazy. And part of what makes a good programmer is somebody who's really lazy. Because your ultimate goal as a programmer is to put yourself out of a job. I want to write software that does everything that I do so I don't have to do it. Right? I am very lazy as a result. So here, this is one of our toolboxes, or this is one of our set of tools. Um, you know, imagine like, you know, the guy who's got like the multiple things hanging off of them, right? And in one of them, it's called MP. And in one of them is this thing called char, which has a, a tool called count. Okay, and char is short for character. Don't ask me why it's pronounced char versus car, but probably because it would sound like car. Um, so what this is going to do is it's going to tell us how many letters there are in each of the chapters. Oh, sorry. It's going to tell us how many times these three characters appear. Okay, so in other words, it's how many mentions of the character Tom, who if you're familiar with the book, Tom Sawyer, appears in the book. And so what's kind of interesting, right, Tom Sawyer has his own book, right, and he's a very kind of important character to Huck Finn as well. But he actually only appears kind of towards the beginning, right? And then like pops in occasionally, but then starts to show up again at the end of the book. All right, so he's he's missing from a lot of it. Um, then, Jimmy, the character Jim. Jimmy read the book. All right, so uh, Jim is another major character, um, but as you can see, he's much more prominent, and so. What we're doing here, right? So this is the part of data science where we talk about exploring the data. When we looked at that blob up there, it's very incomprehensible, right? It's just it's just too much. You can't do anything with it. So you want to start to think about what's there. So maybe we want to know what characters appear the most often. So we look at Tom, who seems to not appear in the middle. And then we look at Jim, who seems to be there all the time. One of the things you might ask is what would happen Oh, actually, we have it here. Um, so now what we can do is we can make a table. Uh, and I should have done a show all, but a table of um, all the characters and how many times their name appears in each chapter. But if you notice, Hawk is actually not very common. Let me know why that might be. And this is one of those stats problems. If you don't have context. He's the narrator. It's a first person book. So the only time the name Huck comes up is if when someone is speaking to him, right? And instead of like a third person book where, you know, they would say Huck says blah, blah, blah. Um, so this is one of those problem areas where, unless you know something about the data, you might make an invalid assumption that Huck's not a very popular character, a very important character. So I just think that's interesting. Um, and then we move on to even better ways to kind of analyze our data, right? So then we can start to make pictures, right? Or graphs. And we can start to think about, oh, look, you know, how common are these characters? Well, we already talked about Huck, who is relatively uncommon because it's the first person. And then Tom, who kind of like starts out a little bit strong in the beginning and then disappears and then comes right back, right? But then Jim is an important character all the way through. So these are the kinds of things we can do when we try to explore what's going on in this data is we can actually you know, do a little bit of math to get to where we can understand what's happening in the book. I apparently talk too much because we're almost out of time. Um, but so then we can move on to Little Women. 
Um, and we kind of do the same thing. We break the book up into chapters. And then we can look at all the different characters. Has anybody here read Little Women? And, yes. Oh, all right. That's you. Um, I, don't, I think I think both those books are becoming unpopular in the like reading cycle for like high school. Uh, so, um, so going by this, who would you say is the most important character? Right. So that looks like they're mentioned the most, you know. Um, and then we start to notice. Let's see if it's. I think it's in the next one. So yeah, we can kind of see that, you know, yes, these characters are relatively important. They all become kind of more, like they talk more essentially as you go towards the end of the book. Um, but then we can start to do other cool things like maybe start to estimate the readability of the book, right? By looking at um, the number of words in a sentence in a chapter, okay? And if you notice, um, both of these books, right? Like this seems to be a denser book than this one because the, the sentences are longer, you know, um, and the chapter lengths are longer. So it might be a little bit more difficult to read than the Huck Fist. Maybe. Um, I don't know enough about linguistics to say for sure, but, you know, these are the kinds of things you can start to explore. Um, and where you find a linguistics friend as a data scientist who can help you figure out what it should mean. Um, and then the last thing we can do is we can continue to visualize it, but this uses a different kind of graph that uses what's called a scatter plot by and showing the number of characters and periods in the chapter. Um, and as you can see, like one is kind of shifted up into the right and one is kind of shifted down to the left. Because this is a lot easier to understand, right, than the prior table. So we start to look at, and graphs will be a very important part of this course as we go forward, and what graph to use when, even though there's only like five options of type, they have very specific useful purposes. And when you try to point, you know, graph type A at problem B, um, and it's the long one, you get really weird results. So one of the things we'll focus on is like, how do we push the data into such a format that we can build a graph that actually tells us what we want, right? Because this graph obviously tells us something very different than like how popular the character is, which uses the line graph and this uses a strata plot. Does that make sense? So this is basically just a little demo to kind of show you, this is the kind of stuff we're gonna to learn to do, um, you know, and how you can start to develop the own, your own problems, right? The own, your own things that you wanna figure out um, and how you would take the tools you'll get in this class to create it for yourself. Uh, let me just see if I have anything else in my awesome slides. Like I said, the slides really need more hacks. Um, but yeah, just the mechanics again. Um, any questions? 